All right, well, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brittany Sharp, and I am a Florida Sea Grant agent here in Hernando County. And I would like to welcome you to our Bite Size Science webinar series. Uh, and today we will be featuring Rick O'Connor, um, who is going to tell us all about uh, diamondback terrapins and then how citizen scientists are helping these terrapins in the panhandle and how you can get involved. So take it away, Rick. All right, thank you very much, Brittany, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, we're gonna be talking about a turtle called a diamondback terrapin and the citizen science work that's going on up here. I'll try to highlight across the state, but the focus will be, will be in the panhandle. Uh, let me just drop that for a second, there we go. Um, it's not advancing. Oh, there we go. All right, so uh, we'll start off with this. What is a terrapin? And I'm finding as I work here in Florida, um, that, that question comes up quite a bit. Um, a lot of folks who do know about it are from the mid-Atlantic area and have transplanted here to the state. And so they are very familiar with it. They're much more abundant in the Chesapeake area than they are here or along the Eastern coast of the United States in general. Uh, but in Florida, a lot of folks are not aware of this thing. And it, it's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, within the group, there is actually seven subspecies of terrapins. Five of those are found in Florida, and three of them are only found in Florida. So actually, if you are looking at diversity, we are a really important state as far as this animal is concerned. Abundance, not as much. And again, that's where some of the new regulations that FWC is bringing on. Uh, is, is trying to, to come in. Uh, it is an emiid turtle. So it's in the same family as what we call pond turtles. They're related to cooters and sliders, even box turtles. Uh, we have a turtle here in the panhandle called map turtle. That's actually its closest cousin. So what is the difference between a terrapin and one of these other turtles? Um, I will go ahead and say first, the term is cultural. Uh, there's nothing biological about the term at all. Um, it's just a, a common name that people have used for them. But if you look at the picture, one of the things you'll notice right off the bat is that really light colored skin. Most turtles uh, have very dark skin and yellow stripes or yellow patches or blotches on the skin. Uh, this one you'll see uh, has got very light skin, almost bluish color. Uh, some of them are more dark gray. You'll see some darker ones here in the presentation. And they have dark speckles. Some of them are, are patches. I have seen stripes and patches and blotches. Uh, this one is, is speckled. So the big, di that's one difference is the coloration. Uh, and the second one is their love of the estuarine environment. This is the only resident brackish water turtle in the United States. You might find some other turtles in estuaries. I have seen sea turtles crossing, entering, especially to eat seagrass, that kind of thing. And some of the other admired turtles, I have said, so we have found cooters that actually had barnacles growing on them. Uh, but we don't think they reside there. They think they're going from point A to point B and happen to be in an estuary for a, a, a period of time. This animal actually lives there. This is where it prefers. So those are the two big differences is that the skin coloration and its preference for habitat. Uh, across the United States, you can find them from Massachusetts all the way to Texas. All along this coast is the range of them. And we actually do have them in Bermuda, believe it or not. They all live on a golf course out there somewhere. Um, but they are, this is their native range. Again, this is where people are very familiar with them. Uh, it's the mascot of the University of Maryland, uh, the Terrapins. Uh, but again, you get into Florida and again, Louisiana and Texas. And so that's the entire range of the animal. Inside Florida, you got up here in the Northeast Coast area. They have a lot of research going on here with Terrapins. Uh, most of that was done by Dr. Joe Butler at the University of North Florida, but there's a, a citizen science team here. Uh, I believe it's the North Florida or the Northeast Florida Land Trust runs a citizen science program here called Team Terrapins. Uh, I think they focus in one geographic area there, but if you're from this part of the state, there is a citizen science effort going on. Um, here you got in Flagler County, you got Dr. Ben Atkinson. He's done a lot of stuff on diamondback terrapins. Most of his work was actually over here in the Big Bend area, but uh, Dr. Atkinson is there. There's been a lot of research going on here in the Eastern uh, coastal area off Merritt Island. Uh, and also the Brevard Zoo is very active in education and outreach on terrapins. I'm not aware that they have a citizen science effort. They might, I'm not sure. Um, but that is one contact in that area. There's been a lot of research going on here in the Southeast as well. This is 
This age range here is what we call the Carolina terrapin. And then down here, we get into uh, what we call the East Coast Florida terrapin. Uh, and so again, a lot of research going on here. There's been a lot of work done in the Florida Keys. This is the, uh, the haunt of the mangrove terrapin. This is where it exists. And it actually reaches into some of the lower parts of, uh, of the Florida Everglades. And then as you move up the coast, you get into what they call the range of the ornate terrapin. Uh, the ornate terrapin's range extends all the way up here to, if you look in the book, it's interesting. They got a line drawn right through the middle of Choctahatchee Bay. So the ornate goes to that line and can't pass it. Uh, certainly they do. And I'll show you some pictures of some that did. But this is a big open space here for the ornate. There's been a lot of work going on here uh, in Collier County. I just got uh, uh, an email from that area. They've already got some uh, nesting going on. Dr. Hart has been down in this area. Uh, you get into the Tampa area. George Heinrich with Heinrich Ecological Services has been one of the big spearheads, along with Joe Butler, on a lot of work with terrapins in this state. And then you get into the Big Bend area. Now, again, there's been some studies done here by uh, Daniel Catazon's been in here. Eric Suarez has done some work up in here. Uh, this is the, uh, the area of Dr. Travis Thomas uh, there in Cedar Key has done a lot of work in this area. And again, Joe Butler and he uh, George Heinrich have done a lot of work here. I'm not aware right now of any citizen science effort going on here. And then you get to the St. Joe Peninsula and all goes quiet. Uh, there has been no research that we can find ever in this part of the state of Florida, uh, and that's why we brought the citizen science effort on. Um, and so we call it the Panhandle Terrapin uh, Project, and it's all citizen science focused to try to put in some of these uh, research gaps that we have. So how do we do this in the Panhandle? Objective number one was, are there even terrapins here? Because no one had done any work at all. And so that was actually objective number one, was to find out if they even existed in the Western Panhandle. We created some wanted posters, and you can see here, this one's a little bit darker. This is the Mississippi Terrapin, which is the one that lives in Pensacola Bay where I'm working. Uh, but you'll find some of what we call suitable habitat. And what we call suitable habitat, they like salt marshes or mangroves in the South Florida area. Uh, they like uh, estuarine uh, uh, wetland areas, uh, open lagoons, lots of creeks. They like that. Uh, this is where they live. They are, have strong site fidelity. They don't generally move around a whole lot. They certainly don't migrate like sea turtles. But the other requirement they have, in addition to having this kind of habitat, they need a food source. They love clams. They love mussels. They love snails. And they have to have a dry, high, dry, sandy beach or something. It might be a road. It could be a mound of oyster shells. But they got to have something like that in order to lay eggs. And what we know is they usually don't travel very far looking for those. Again, they have very, very strong site fidelity. So we went to these locations, did some beach surveys. We put wanted posters near the um, uh, boat ramps near these kind of locations in our part of the state. And we have found at least one record in every county. So objective number one is complete. Uh, yes, diamondback terrapins do exist in the Florida panhandle. Uh, now we move on to number two, which is assessing their status. And this is kind of, again, where we've got a lot of citizen science effort going on. Uh, we got, as you can see here, broken down into three parts to look at their status. Now, when I'm working on this, you know, your, your first thought is like, are, you know you've got terrapins. What is their population status? Uh, we have not tackled that one here locally for a couple of reasons. One, when I first started working on this, Back in 2005, I was in a position where I just did not have time during the day to get that done. Uh, and also, when I'm working with um, citizen science, I have learned that they are very good at collecting data and doing measurements that they're comfortable with doing. So if we give them too much to do and they get uncomfortable, what I have found, this has been a, a question about citizen science for decades, that you get into a quality control issue. Uh, what I have found with my volunteers is if it gets too complicated, they tell me, like, Rick, I, I can't do that and I won't do that. So uh, I appreciate that comment. And so what we have done is we have kind of focused our, more on relative abundance, and I'll show you how we do that. But that's our first priority uh, each year. And we started this week. We've already found one track. And so it's off and running. Um, so we are focusing on relative abundance of the animal here in the panhandle. That's priority number one. Number two, we would like to know how they're using the habitat. 
uh, we have tagged two terrapins here that have one traveled over 30 miles and a second one last year, she traveled over 60 miles, which all the literature tells you that, that they don't normally do that. So this is something that's second priority, but we're very interested in finding out just how far our terrapins move up here. Um, there's a lot of other information, you know, do they spend all winter in one creek? How are they using the creeks, et cetera? And so to do that, we can put pit tags, we can do notching, we teach our volunteers how to do that. Um, and we also, if we have the opportunity, we'll put a satellite tag on them. The third thing and the lowest priority project for us is uh, there has been a need or request for genetics from FWC, particularly for the Mississippi Terrapin, which is currently only listed in Pensacola Bay. And so they want to find out how strong that genetic isolation is. Are they interbreeding with the ornate at all? Um, so if we can get tissue and blood samples, and we will, um, that is priority number three, but that is one of the, the uh, pieces of this objective as well. As far as doing the relative abundance, um, we are using what I call the MAN method. I got this method from Tom Mann. He works for the Division of Natural Resources and Wildlife in Mississippi. And he was working with the Mississippi Terrapin, which is the one that I'm working with. So I reached out to Tom. I'm part of the Gulf Coast Terrapin Working Group. And Tom and I sat down and discussed this method and decided this might be a good one for citizen scientists to do. It is based on a couple of assumptions. And I have to make sure everybody who reads our reports understands that. And assumption number one is that all adult females in your population nest every year. We don't know for sure that they do that, but this method is based on that assumption that yes, every female in that population is going to come up on the beach and lay at least one nest every year. And that is assumption number two. We know the literature will support this, that most of these terrapins will come up and lay at least two or three clutches each year, sometimes as many as four. But we believe, at least with the Mississippi terrapin, we believe that, they, that the female will not lay a clutch more than once in a 16 day period. So every track or every nest we find in a 16, a new one, every new track and new nest we find in a 16 day period equals one female. And going on the assumption that the sex ratio is one to one between male and females, then if I have 10 new tracks in a 16 day period, we have roughly 20 individuals living in this population. Now, again, those are some assumptions. A couple of things we already know about um, the Diamondback Terrapins in the Panhandle. Uh, we've had a couple of studies, one by Dan Catazone and another one by Eric Suarez that shows the sex ratio is strongly favoring males here. Uh, one study showed one to three. The other study showed one to five. And we've seen the similar thing with the sea turtles here in the Panhandle. It's colder here. And for those who may not be aware of this, uh, sex determination for the, for the turtles is determined on temperature of the egg during incubation. The colder eggs become males and the warmer eggs are females. So being colder in this part of Florida, we tend to produce more males. Uh, and so that would make sense on, on these ratios. Again, we would love to have some more research going on in our part of the panhandle to see if that holds. But going on the assumption of one to one, we can double that and that kind of gives us a rough idea. I will go ahead and tell you in my reports, I actually give the relative abundance based on one to one, one to three and one to five. So they can see that. And then the last thing, which obviously makes sense, is do you know where all the nesting beaches are? Uh, we are not sure that we do. We know where we have some, and we are monitoring those, uh, but we're not 100% sure that we have found them all. So that's how we do our relative abundance. What we do with our, and I've done our trainings this week. I've got one more to do over in Okaloosa County. We got rained out this week, so we couldn't get that one done. But what we ask our volunteers to do, priority one, is to walk an assigned beach. We know where they're definitely nesting, and that is priority one, is to get our volunteers out walking these known nesting beaches at least once a week. I'm really shooting for three times a week, and it doesn't have to be the same volunteer. The more volunteers we have, we can like spread the love. Uh, but I would really like to have a human on that beach no fewer than once a week uh, to try to capture these, these tracks and things. This is what they're looking for. They have a data sheet, they'll walk along, they see a terrapin track like this, 
They will report the number of tracks they see. I ask them then to kind of mark this somehow, put an X through it. If it's not very long, take your foot, scrub it. The purpose of that is if you come back in two days and see this, you understand that that's not a new terrapin, uh, you know, so it, for our relative abundance uh, calculation. So we want to make sure, and maybe it'll be a new volunteer. You go out on Monday, someone else goes out on Wednesday. Uh, they don't think that this is a new one, that this one has actually already been logged. So this is what the Terrapin tracks look like. So we ask them to log the number they see each time they go out. And as I just said, uh, remove any evidence of that so that they're not recounted. Um, 80 to 90% of the nests are depredated by raccoons. That's an unfortunate problem but it does kind of help us track where the terrapins are nesting. And it also gives us uh, some information on how many females are coming up. So yes, this is what it looks like. When the raccoons dig the nest up, they eat the eggs and they leave the shells laying right here. They're very soft and pliable. They roll up, you'll see the sun getting to them. They kind of roll up <clears throat> when that track goes up. A lot of time we see they go towards shrubs, uh, seem to like to really head to, towards the shrubs. And I was showing the group yesterday what to look for. We did find some digging activity, but yesterday we didn't find any evidence of nesting. Uh, but this is one thing that tells you. Now, if they find this, they, that we have on the data sheet, the number of depredated nests that you found. So they'll log that. And then we ask them to remove these shells so that either themselves or a new volunteer does not count this as a new terrapin. And we get the wrong assumption on how many terrapins are actually here. So tracks and depredated nests. Another thing we might find, this is very hard, but you can, you'll notice here, here's a track going up, it hits a point and it comes back. Unfortunately, I didn't take a very good photograph of that, but it makes an apex. And just above the apex, if you dig in the sand, you might find these. This is what we call an intact nest. This is an active nest, the raccoons have not found it. Um, and so we have uh, on our data sheet where they will mark how many active nests or uh, intact nests they have found. Now, some of the sea turtle folks, some of you may work with sea turtles and have seen uh, where they'll actually remove these eggs and they count them. We don't. And my purpose for that is I don't know the number in the panhandle. We believe it's relatively low. There is uh, the, the, the possibility of actually doing harm to the turtle by turning or twisting the egg. And so I just ask my volunteers, please don't move them. If you find them, then we put a GPS mark on that. We'll come back in 50 days, from 50 to 90 days, and check this nest to see if it was a successful hatch. But we are not pulling the eggs out. And every once in a while, again, it's kind of like finding an apex. Uh, once in a blue moon, you'll find a female uh, just standing right there, you know, walking across the sand. And that's a big day. Most of my volunteers have not seen that. We, I hope they all get to one day. Um, but uh, again, if you find a female, we obviously have that in the data sheet. How many females did you find? We ask our volunteers to bring a five gallon bucket. They can place this in here. I will add here uh, prior to March 1st, this was fine without a permit. Now you do have to have a permit to have a terrapin in your possession. So uh, we do have a permit. I'm partnering with USGS. They oversee the permitting. And so we do have permits for all of our volunteers so they can pick this turtle up and, and bring it to us. Um, and then we will work with them on the workup and I'll show you how we do that in a moment. But, and then we turn it, we try to return it within 24 hours, that's the goal. It may take a you know, couple of days, but we're trying to get it done within 24 hours. The new thing we added to our um, data sheet this year is human activity. Uh, on the beach and why we added that, we noticed uh, particularly in Okaloosa County, uh, a lot of the terrapins are using islands um, to nest. And there was a lot of terrapin activity, particularly on one of them. There was a lot of humans using what they call Crab Island over there. It's not really an island, it's an area at the mouth of Choctahatchee Bay that's real shallow. A lot of boat activity, a lot of partying going on. And every year it seems to get wilder and wilder and wilder. And I know the county has tried to figure out how to address that problem. Some people have left that and have now started showing up to these isolated islands further west of them where the terrapins are. And early indication is that this may impact the nesting activity. We don't know. So we added that to our data sheet this year. Did you see any humans on your nesting beach? How many? What were they doing? Did they have pets? Things like that. So uh, that is a new piece to this survey that we're doing. 
And then if we have time, not all of them have time, but if we have time, we ask them to do a 30 minute head count. It's not easy. I don't know if you saw it right away, but there it is. Uh, again, we talked about terrapins having a white head, not a dark head. If you've got the sun in front of you, however, all heads are dark. So I always tell my volunteers, please get the sun behind you if possible. You can stand on the beach for a 30 minute period and count how many heads you see. Uh, this was done from a kayak. We have a lot of folks who just sit in the kayak and drift across the lagoon and count the number of heads they see in a 30 minute period. This is something a lot of the other researchers are doing for relative abundance. Obviously, if I count 15 heads, that doesn't mean 15 terrapins. But our argument is if I normally see around 10 to 15 heads in a 30 minute period, and then over time that goes up to 20 or 25 heads, uh, obviously the abundance is increasing or the opposite, you know, if we're seeing less, um, that maybe something is going on within the population. So this is something we ask them to do while they're out there. If they capture any, and we do have some set capture dates that we try to do, again, as you saw on the list, it's priority two and three. Uh, but if we do capture them, we do have the equipment. Uh, each county has a site coordinator. Uh, in our region. And each of those coordinators, I believe, have at least three of these bags. And inside of the bags are everything they need to get measurements off the shell. You know, we'll identify the sex, we'll get the mass, uh, we'll take tissue sample, we'll get a blood sample. If we've got a pit tag, we'll do a pit tag. If we don't, we can do a triangle notch on the skew here along the margin. We teach them how to do that. Uh, we are kind of there for that. We're going to make sure this gets done because I know a lot, this goes back to what I was saying, a lot of our volunteers are not comfortable doing this on their own, but they would love to help and participate. So they have our phone number, they give us a call and we take care of that. And if we have a satellite tag available, we'll put one of those on. We have satellite tag two in the area so far. And then this is, a, I didn't mention this on there, but <clears throat> we said we're not sure where all the beaches are. If time permits and they want to continue and go out uh, and just fall in love with terrapins, visit some of these other beaches that we are don't have on our list that might look like good potential sites to see if they find any of that. They don't need to go every week, just once in a while. Joe Butler and George Heinrich did this in the uh, Big Bend area, they just went to each of these beaches looking for any evidence that terrapins were using these things and made a mark. That way, if a researcher or another citizen science group wanted to come back and do some work, they have all these sites already uh, marked for you on, on their spreadsheet, and so you'll know where to go. And I got lucky enough one day just to find a female walking across uh, uh, this marsh area here, so that was kind of a cool day. When do we do it? Again, as I said, we do April through June. Uh, I will be honest with you, when I started partnering with USGS, they really wanted us to go from April through September. We did that for two years, and I started getting some kickback from my volunteers. They just thought that was two, six months of this was just too much. Uh, so we have gone back to April and June. The reason we picked that, this is peak nesting season. And so they'll come up on these beaches uh, the peak for us in our part is usually late May, early June, though we are starting to see a little bit more of a shift more into May and less in June. But that's the peak. And after that, nesting slows down. So you stop seeing the tracks, you stop seeing the nest, that kind of thing. And it's harder to track this. But I will say we, when we went out in July, we found a lot of evidence even in July. Uh, so um, I, I will in, encourage my volunteers to go longer if they can, but we're asking them to do uh, at least these months here. And again, if I can get one time a week, I'm happy. I would really like to get three times a week. And if you're interested in starting something like this, one of the things I do tell them, it is so much better to do this during the weekday. On the weekend, all these beaches have a lot of activity, dogs, footprints, anchor drags. I mean, all evidence of terrapins disappears very quickly. And I will add this too on our sandy beaches, uh, heavy rains, and we've been getting them here the last couple of years, will wash away some of this evidence too, which is why I don't think we saw any yesterday. Uh, so I kind of I kind of give them that advice. Where are we doing it? I will add this. We are not speaking directly where these sites are. Everybody on the team knows where they are, but we are asking them not to put this on social media. We are having problems with poaching. Uh, this is not Diamondback Terrapins. This uh, was a photograph that Bill Turner with FWC and George Heinrich took. They were at the Tampa International Airport and just randomly selected a few boxes. These are soft shell turtles that were on their way to Asia. 
Uh, they were illegally harvested and being shipped. So we know this is going on with terrapins too, primarily for the pet trade. So we are not uh, telling folks about the exact location of where we are actually going. And if you try to start a program, um, I would encourage you to do that as well. All right, so now you guys will get to do a poll and um, you should see the poll on your screen. So the next couple of minutes, if you could uh, let us know how many of you are there, what you learned, it helps us to evaluate our program. And we'll leave that up. And if you have questions, here's Rick's information, but also uh, we have a few more minutes if you'd like to post them in the chat box and we will answer them live. So while everyone's doing the poll, Rick, we have one question asking turtles versus tortoise. Is there a difference? Again, it's a cultural term. Tortoise is normally used for land turtles. Um, but as you know, it's people have asked me, why don't they call it a box tortoise? You can. <laughs> uh, there's nothing biological about the term. So, uh, but uh, the gopher tortoise, uh, the sulcata tortoise, again, and you, when you see that term tortoise, they're generally thinking of a land turtle. Do males ever come on shore is our next question. Not that I know of. I mean, we have, I, I don't know of any, any records of males up on the beach. That's actually an interesting question, um, but we don't believe they do, no. All right, well, it looks like, um, Almost everyone has had a chance to answer the poll on your screen. Oh, we have one more question. Sure. What do terrapins eat? Ah, they're shellfish feeders. In captivity, or, or you know, we've got a couple at uh, the Roy Hyde Environmental Center. They will eat anything with shells. So, I mean, shrimp, they love them. Crabs, fiddler crabs are a big part of their diet. They will eat small juvenile blue crabs. And we're going to talk later somewhere down the road. They do have a habit of going into crab traps. And that's been problematic both for the crab fishery and for the terrapins. Um, but in the wild, when you look at their diet content, it's primarily mollusk. We see the marsh periwinkle is very common in their guts up here. Uh, um, uh, some mussels and clams. But my thought is that those obviously are much easier to catch. Uh, if you put some of these other things in an aquarium with them or an exhibit, and they have a better opportunity of catching them, they will certainly eat them. And one of our viewers is in Maryland and they uh -huh. were not aware that terrapins were in Florida. I know, isn't that weird? And Florida's, Floridians are not aware, but you guys are, you definitely know they're there. Go Terps, hell in a shell. Our, next question, our next question asks, uh, what are the ideal results from the conservation efforts? The ideal results, we, that's a, an interesting question too. We have been dealing with or working on conservation efforts since I started on this thing in 2005. One of the questions FWC had, and it's a, it's a fair question, is what were the terrapin populations historically? We know right now that terrapins, I mean, you guys who live in Florida, you can go anywhere in this state, go down a, a ditch along the side of the road or a spring, and you will see turtles basking on logs and you'll see heads in the water, but you don't see terrapins. Now, if you go up to Maryland and Virginia and those places, it's the opposite. I have a friend who loves to go to Assateek Island in Maryland. Maybe our, our contact there knows about that location. They see them frequently up there. Um, so we don't see a lot here. And so one of the questions is, uh, you know, is that been the case historically or has something happened to deplete the population? I will uh, also add to that, we had the same issue. I'm up here in Pensacola, right by Mobile Bay. And they had the same issue over there, but they came across an 1890 newspaper article that talked about a terrapin farm in Mobile Bay that was doing 25,000 terrapins a year. And so they realized very quickly, like, yes, our populations are definitely down. They are not seeing that in Mobile Bay anymore. We aren't seeing it in the Panhandle or really anywhere in Florida. We don't know if historically ours were low or not. So a lot of the conservation effort was, you know, are we actually down? Are we where we're supposed to be? But since our numbers are very, very low, a lot of the researchers have kind of pushed for some conservation effort. 
uh, to help protect the low numbers that we do have. And one of those changes right now uh, is effective. Um, March 1st of this year, you're no longer allowed to have them as, as a pet. Um, you used to be able to have prior to uh, March, you could have two. If you've got two, you can get a no cost permit and keep your turtle. They're not going to take it from you, but they're no longer allowed people to take them from the wild anymore. And starting next year, uh, there will be some regulations on the crab traps. Uh, Brittany and I are working on that right now. Um, FWC has already put out their social media post on that, but they are going to be modifying the crab traps to try to keep the terrapins out. I don't know what to do about the raccoons. <laughs> They're a problem. We have a lot of uh, great comments in the chat box saying that your presentation um, was just right. Um, it was yeah. the right size, bite-sized presentation and thank you so much. <laughs> All right, thank um, you. We, I'd also like to remind everyone that our next bite size uh, webinar will be on May 5th at 1230. And we will have Victor Blanco uh, discussing his artificial reef monitoring program. Um, and I believe the registration for that has been placed in the chat box. So check that out. And thank you, Rick, for your great presentation yep. today on your diamondback terrapins. It's always very interesting to listen to you talk about these, these really neat turtles. Thank you. So with that, um, we are over time. So we'll let you guys go and hope to see you next month. That was really cool, Rick. Thanks, 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 thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we got very, very excited. We found our first track. And actually, what was cool, it was a brand new.